So while I was out on my recent road trip across Europe, I got to spend two days geeking out with E3D. It's always kind of mind blowing to see all the things that are going on and all the stuff they're working on. Of course, the goal for the trip was to film for my RepRap documentary, but we also recorded an episode of the Melt Zone podcast that I usually just do with uh, Stefan from CNC Kitchen. You can check that out up here, right there. We recorded a factory tour of E3D's new headquarters, and this video we talk about the new products like the tool changer that's now starting to ship, the new crazy heated beds, the super volcano, and we also get a sneak peek at what E3D is cooking up next when it comes to extruders and hardens. So let's check that out. We'll begin. We've, we've got a few things, so let's actually start with... This. I've been told I have to be concise, and I have a reputation for not being concise. Uh, anyway, so here we go. We're going to do a speed run through. Yeah, this is got, a Mordor bed. We've got it, like six things to talk about, so yes. All right, set one. This is a Mordor bed. Um, it's a heated bed. It gets really, 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 really hot. 200 degrees, 250. It's for printing peak and other high temperature polymers. It's made with a sheet of aluminum tooling plate that's extremely flat. And on the back, we have a silicon rubber heater. I know everyone's looking at this going, I, oh yeah, you can get silicon rubber heaters and, and aluminium plates. What's different about this? Other silicon rubber plates have an adhesive on them that is limited to 100 degrees. You try and heat the plate up to beyond 100, 150, this will melt, you get goop, you've tried it, it goes horribly wrong. I tried cooking sausages on a printer, it just bubbled off. And this one's not gonna do that. So this no. one is directly fused onto the other. Yeah, one. we don't use adhesive, we cure the silicone into the aluminium. Um, yeah. We anodize it to open up pores. We get halfway through the anodizing process to open up the pores. And then we use heat and pressure to cure the silicon into the aluminium. So it's keyed and bonded and vulcanized onto the aluminium. Yeah, and just, just for reference, so this one is a 200 by 300 millimeter bed. And it says on here, this is 800 watts, which is uh, crazy. That's a crazy amount of power for, for this size bed. How long does this take to get up to print temperatures? Uh, it depends what that temperature is, right? Let's, let's so just like, say like 80. 80, degrees. I don't know, so probably like 30 seconds or so. <laughs> yeah. Um, God damn it, you guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but these, these um, some cautionary notes, these run on mains voltage, they need to be earthed. They're for people that know what they're doing um, and they need checking. Um, and yes, you will burn yourself if you touch it while it gets hot. Um, but they're for running at 200 degrees, not at 80 degrees. Yeah, so um, absolute max temperature? Uh, 250. 250. Um, so but you're skirting safety. close to the line. You, you can run for hundreds of hours at 200 and we've done that. Um, other little things we've got, so the aluminium expands. So we have these slots here that allow for a certain amount of expansion and contraction of the plate. Um, it will be supplied with standoffs that are made of polyphenol sulfone, yep. which is a high temperature polymer. Which we can put, no, that's, is that something uh, different? Uh, these have ceramic standoffs Ooh. from an earlier prototype, but the PPSE ones are actually nicer. Um, yeah, it stops the heat traveling down into your printer and stays stiff. Okay, um, and so sizes, the, because 300 by 200 not exactly the standard size? Uh, yeah, it comes in the 200, the uh, 200 by 300, the uh, 250 by 250, something like that. I've, it, it lots of sizes, yeah, and a 300 so, by 300. Well, standard 214 by 214, the, the Prusa. Yeah, size. sorry, I said 200 yeah. by 200, it's 200 by 200 printable area, okay, so 215 it's, it's by 215 mechanical area. Yeah, it, yes. it's that like, all the, the heater we know and love yeah. for making 200 by 200 print spaces. And how expensive is that gonna be? Uh, I think the 200 by 200 one is around 100 pounds. Right. Um, and then they cost more as they get bigger. Which, you know, I, I think is, is very reasonable. So if you consider having to buy a plate, having to buy a heater, you're already at 30, 40 bucks. Yeah. But then you also have to consider you need to buy a larger power supply because you're not going to get yep. 800 watts out of your... <laughs> and a solid state relay, which we'll be supplying. Yes. Well, um, you, you're not including with that, but you can buy from, from E3D, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Included kit-wise, you can add it onto your order. One more thing I'd like to mention is that these are made by a company that make um, heaters for wing de-icers for airplanes and aerospace. Right. Um, one of our objectives here was to have like a, a known reliable device with, you know, dealing with mains voltage yeah. and people playing around. So these are, yeah, they're designed to be a proper bit of kit, not a piece of cowboy engineering, I suppose, which is all too common out there. So tool changer, this is the, the current revision, I guess, the current status of development. Yeah, so everything's made um, with kind of more mature manufacturing processes. Uh, I think one of the biggest ones is that all of the tool changer components are machined and not laser cut and cobbled together or made of like printed parts. So everything is made on 
on production ready processes. Um, a lot of the kind of cheap and nasty bits that were on the original tool changer have now been updated and you know we have machine coupling blocks, housings for the magnets, um, everything kind of just clunks and clips into place. And I mean, in general, this thing is, is it looks very, very solidly built, very well engineered. Um, this is the beta or well, small run that's going to be actually ship out. Yeah, this is the fit up prototype for what we're calling beta 30, i.e. the first 30 machines to go yeah. out. So not your 30th revision? No, no. Yeah, so uh, naming convention is like beta, you might have beta 1 for one beta tester, beta 5, beta 10, beta 100. Um, and those that's the size of the beta testing group. So this is for, for our initial run will be 30 machines going out to beta testers. I would probably class them more as release candidates than betas. Um, yeah. We are in a beta you expect change. We don't expect any change and we hope that they go to the, you know, we then yeah. proceed to batches of 50 and 100 in production. So once the beta phase is, is over, people will be able to buy the tool changer, but again, not as a, as a finished machine, right? Yeah, they'll be able to buy the motion system and the tool changer that goes onto the motion system yeah. and the tools. And those will all be separate products that if you wish, you can buy the motion system and the tool grab ahead and the tools to go onto it and a duet, etc., and build yourself a fully functioning machine. Um, but our objective is to enable and educate people in the ways of tool changing, um, get more companies adopting tool changing, more makers adopting tool changing, show them that it can be done, um, provide them a reference platform and the tools that they need to do it themselves. Um, so our objective is to not monopolize the market of tool changing 3D printing, our objective is to get it out there um, and make tool changing a common thing in a 3D printing yeah, community. And to, right, you've talked about that, that the goal is to have this as an open system and not just you know being the E3D tool changer but the de facto standard tool changer as you've done with the V6 standard. Yes, before, I guess. yeah um, and so we, we would hope for a much more fixed and less fluid standard um, than the previous <laughs> Groove mount standard. We've um, learned. We've learned. Um, so we, we would hope to fix a robust and future forward looking standard um, for tool changing parts that will allow us to do a wide variety of things with tool changing that's not just FDM with a V6. Um, we would hope to be doing the full range of things that we've discussed at length, you know, your additive, subtractive, measurement, metrology, insertion, pick and place. But right now, it's all about getting this thing done and getting it out with yeah. multiple 3D printed I, we, we get, tools. We get a lot of questions like, where's the inspection camera, where's the touch probe, etc. We are pedal to the metal on getting beta 30 out with V6s on it, um, and kind of nothing else matters to us at the moment. We've got commitments to those people that are prepaid, um, and we need to we need to come up with the goods that we've promised effectively and the best way to get tool changing onto the market is to do this and then once this is out there the whole community can build tools not just us so that's our objective that's why we're not developing tools we're developing yeah. the changer and you mentioned that uh, you're kind of running into limits with just linear oh, linear rails like yeah don't get me started so um highwind at the moment have a six month lead time on certain rails and preloads. Yeah, you're enjoying those. So those are um, so much. Can, can I take this thing home? Mm, no, sadly not. You've oh. not believe how much those rails cost. So they cost three times as much as high wind rails do. And high wind rails are already expensive. Right. Made by a company called IKO. Oh, they're nice though, huh? It's like, a, uh, <laughs> it's so like something, silk. Yeah, it's, it's almost unbelievable how smooth those are. And you can actuate the whole yeah, so there's like one. no no slop in there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're having to explore alternative suppliers while maintaining our kind of high standards for yeah. linear rails. Um, we should be fine for high win on XY. Um, the big problem is the extra wide rail that has to have a specific preload um, to ensure it doesn't yeah. have any slop in it. Yeah, another thing we've updated is we've had them change the layup, weave and direction of the carbon fiber layup. So they actually make the panel for us and then cut it. So the carbon fiber isn't just for you know swag. 
no, design. No, no, no. It's actually functional. Yeah, so in the original ones, it was like quasi-isotropic, crisscross carbon fiber. Um, but to increase the torsional stiffness of this beam, which is actually quite important, um, we've added more unidirectional fiber, particularly at the top and bottom. And that means that as you're tool changing and you're picking up these um, slightly cantilevered loads that apply a torsional load to the crossbar, uh, we've got much more resistance to, to that. And yeah, it's cool to be able to adjust materials on like the fiber wise basis to get that going. So that was the tool changer that's your new like 3D printer bit, yep. uh, machine wise. Let's actually talk about like your core thing of yeah, making hot ends. Hot ends. Yeah, that's what we do. Making these things, like this is, take a look at this. So that's a, that's a gold arrow heat sink and that is the super volcano. Yes, gold arrow is not out yet, but that's ah. kind of, we make sure it's like arrow, but with Noctua fan and all the upgraded stuff. But anyway, moving on, um, super volcano. Sorry it's taken us so long. Um, so challenges, making holes that long in nozzles is very difficult, um, especially when you get into tool steels and plating down deep holes, that's been troublesome. Um, as well as drilling the deep hole for the sensor and the like through the copper. copper and this is a special high temperature copper that's extra nasty to machine. Then we've had to, well, we've had to change the whole block to copper because we need so many watts in here to melt the plastic quick yeah, and, enough. And this is, this is surprisingly heavy. Like if I hold this just vertically, yeah. horizontally. Sorry. Copper's dense. It, it is very dense and I'm, I'm kind of afraid for the, for the heat break in here. So that's your standard 175 stainless heat break and yeah. that's that's still holding up. With yeah, I, I had concerns too. Um, then we've tried it, we printed with it. I mean, have a go on it. I'm not gonna break this. I'm, I will break you, this You, you will be able to break, but it's surprisingly it. resilient. Uh, you are changing a few things about your, your hardened steel nozzles too, right? We're keeping hardened steel nozzles and they're not changing. We are introducing a new nozzle yeah. Um, which internally we've been calling Ulti Nozzle um, because we don't have a good name for it. But it's made of a new type of tool steel um, that is harder and stays hard, so i.e. it does not temper um, yeah. until higher temperatures. So conventional tool steel begins to temper and soften around the 350 to 400 region. Um, but sometimes we have to print peak and other materials up at those temperatures. So we're beginning to lose some of our hardness. So if we want to print carbon fiber reinforced peak, we're losing hardness. Yeah. So that's one advantage. So we've got the high temperature, high hardness tool yeah. steel. So why, why not go with a Ruby insert or something? Um, rubies are extremely difficult to manufacture into the favorable geometries for flow inside of a nozzle. Um, and so if you've ever printed with a ruby tipped nozzle, you'll know that there are some slight aberrations in flow and things, your, your yeah. response of extrusion is not quite as good. Um, and some things can be, generally the quality of extrusion is diminished due to your constraints on the shape you can make the ruby. Um, whereas so, if we're yeah. using metals and we're making them with our current manufacturing techniques, we have a great deal of freedom and experience so we can make the geometry on the inside exactly as per a brass nozzle and you get effectively the same flow and response that you know and love from your E3D hot end. We've got the high, um, this high hardness, high temperature tool steel. Then we apply a even harder nickel coating that makes things very, That's very the smooth. Super alloy kind of thing, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, nickel plating goes on, and then we're applying this nano coating to the outside of the nickel that stops the plastic sticking. So this is like no holds barred. Throw everything awesome that we have at one nozzle. No, no compromises. That's, that's no, the other thing. Yeah, it's the no compromises nozzle. Yeah. Um, but even then it will be way cheaper than say a ruby nozzle um, while still being able to print huge quantities of carbon fiber at extreme temperatures. Yeah. Do we talk about why these are only available in copper? Yeah, yeah, and also the heater. So the amount of power that we need to put into this heater block to melt all the plastic that's flowing through is high enough that if we used an aluminium block, we could potentially quite easily melt the aluminium block, which is not a good situation at all, um, potentially dangerous. So we have made a copper block and we will only be selling these with a copper block so there won't be an aluminium block available. So we've got these heater cartridges, most of which is snuck away inside of the block but it's a double length heater. Yeah, you can see is... it's sticking out on the end here and the wire is going here. So yeah. it goes all the way through. All the way through, 80 watts, um, lots of power. Yeah, we've, we've got a... Oh, sweet. Here we go. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that is not your, your mom's heater cartridge. No, no, application specific heater cartridge for heating these up and these up only. And while we're at the topic of, uh, you know, heaters and, and melting stuff down, that's, that's, this is also new. Yeah, so it's a heater cartridge. It's got a conformal coating on the outside, which is kind of like, um, kind of does the same job as thermal paste. It can squeeze into cracks and transfer heat more effectively. On the inside, the internal construction is drastically different. We're using a different alloy wire um, to heat up the inside, which is more resistant at higher temperatures. And they're generally built to a significantly higher standard, which means that compared to a normal heater cartridge, which will maybe get you through a few hundred hours of printing at 400 degrees, these will go for thousands and thousands of hours. Um, at and at the very yeah. high end temperature. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think these are not something that you'd put in in like a normal PLA. No, yeah. no, not at all. Um, so these are, yeah, they're for printing high temperature materials. Yeah, specifically. Specifically, um, they come as such um, with a detachable cable. You've you've kind of been talking to me about like why there isn't a, a new V7 out yet. I mean, the, the V6 so far, we're doing pretty well. I mean, it's it's standing up, but it's it's showing its age. Kind yeah. Of, well, it's still performs well, but it's yeah. I suppose you know, the V6 that we know and love is very different from the V6 that was launched, and every single part of it's right. changed. And that's kind of why there hasn't been a new updated version. It's kind of like like Falcon 9 eating Falcon Heavy's lunch. As we kind of increase right. the capability of the, the base product, then the need to do a jump iteration to the next one diminishes. Um, however, I think that what we're looking at for the future is to reduce cost, improve ease of use, and maintain or improve performance. Yeah, um, and I guess a big challenge is you're putting out so many hot ends these days that yep. just machining every single bit and, and assembling so many parts kind of doesn't make sense anymore. Absolutely, I, I, it's almost, you, we, you can see the obvious redundancy in having heater cartridges, sensors, heater blocks, heat brakes yeah. and nozzles that all then have to be manually assembled. The heater block's an awkward machine part on all sides. You have to make these sensors and put them in. Um, there's, there's definitely room for integration and consolidation there, um, which I can see that there could be some downsides, i.e. you can't like swap out the sensor piecemeal. But if we can reduce the cost of that whole assembly such that you can take your this whole hot side, this whole functional part yeah. of your hot end and replace it with a abrasive resistant version that goes to higher temperatures and the cost isn't prohibitive and the ease of use of doing so warrants the small amount of extra cost and I believe that that makes sense. Yeah and if you can can bring the reliability of the entire thing up I mean it's it's already very good I've, I don't think I've ever swapped out a thermistor on a, on a V6 on a cartridge V6. Yeah. Um, if you can bring up the, the reliability to, to a point where it's it's okay to have all this stuff bundled in yeah. and drop the price significantly. Yeah. Um, Why I, not? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that if we can um, make the process of swapping out these functional parts of the hot end much easier, then it's going to allow more people to experiment with more configurations. Because yeah. um, some people are afraid to sit there and at like a high temperature, take apart their nozzle and then put in a new one, tighten it to a specific torque at a specific temperature, burn yourself along the way. Yeah. Like, so kind of the, the experience of a, of a Ultimaker print core, something but like that. just at a, at a much more approachable level. Yes, the, the price point would be much more down to what we used to at the kind of uh, maker level. Um, so we wouldn't be looking at too much more than a conventional nozzle. We'd hope to maintain yeah. that region of pricing, um, but still keep that hot swappable. Yeah, but but all of that is, is still very experimental and conceptual still, right? There's yeah. A lot of yeah. tangible stuff there. What is, however, very tangible is the uh, the new extruder thing that we... Oh uh, yeah, the new cast. extruder. Again, like, like many things at E3D, it doesn't yet have a name because it's not finished. So we've seen this this setup uh, uh, yeah. uh, in the factory tour, but that's actually the, the new bit. The work yes, in this is the new thing. It's a super early, uh, early prototype kind of in the conceptual stage. Um, this is kind of a successor to Titan Aero, if you like. It's that integrated all-in-one extruder and hot end system. Yeah. Um, but by the way, what we're showing here is again a work in progress. This is not something that is. Yeah, I mean it's way it way larger than it will be in production, um, and the appearance and surface finish and things like that is very far 
far off um, what we would seek to achieve in production. But our objectives here were to reduce cost by using processes that allow us to make many very quickly at a low cost, um, to reduce size and weight and increase ease of use. Yeah, it's so very similar with, with the next generation of hot ends and the next generation of extruders. Absolutely. I mean, you, you've mentioned many times that we've reached a level of good enough in many things in 3D printing. And so our fitness function has changed from performance over to things like convenience factors and price. Um, and that's what the market is valuing at the moment. And we need to kind of you know, pay attention to that. So we need to bring down the cost of our products while remaining, um, remaining at that good enough performance level and also enhance ease of use and the kind of customer experience. This has a long way to go before it's a production item, yeah. um, and it will probably look nothing like this when it gets to when it gets to market. Um, it's True. got a lot of lead time on the tooling and things like that, but we're very very excited for this one when it comes out because it's going to have a really revolutionary price point um, and performance that rivals the best in class on the market um, in all aspects. All the features, yeah, in a small package at a good cost. I mean that. How can you not? How can you not <laughs> that's like the it? objective, right? Yeah, uh, but um, again, that's that's so a bit further out. Yeah. So yeah, uh, lots of lots of good stuff going on. Lots of new stuff. Thank you. The works. On Monday, we have coming out the more door beds and the uh, super high temperature heater cartridges. Again, by the time you're watching this video, those are going to be out. Those are going to be available. Yes. We may have changed the names to something more professional and appropriate rather than the internal names. Possibly. But you know, th those things that you've seen, they'll be out. Um, next up is Super Volcano, which is a couple yeah. of weeks away. It's just waiting on brass nozzles to come in for machining. Um, then from there on out, what do we have? We've got the Tool Changer Beta 30, um, which I believe all of the parts for that are in to the point where we can start building them. We're still waiting on a couple of little parts, yeah. um, but we're we're down to like we're waiting on a gear and we're waiting on a couple bits and pieces. Yes. But that is much less of a of a like mass product. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and then subsequent to that, moving that product into production. I suppose that's your E3D timeline for the next six months. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for those updates and uh, thank you for watching. As always, the products we talk about in the videos are linked in the video description below. And special thanks to all my patrons that make it possible for me to produce these videos in the first place. Thank you to Philip Gog, Mike McGee, JB, Hussein Karatas, NM Creator, and Hannes Kampenhuber, who are some of the patrons in the shouter tier. But you can also join on Patreon to join a monthly hangout, or even join in for some one-on-one -on -one time every month. Thank you all so much for your support, but remember also just hitting that subscribe button helps out a ton, as does simply watching and sharing my videos. Again, thanks for that, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>